G'day everyone and welcome to the Trade Mate Sports Betting Podcast. Today I'm joined by snooker tipster George Wayham. Welcome to the podcast, mate. Hi, thanks very much for having me on, Alex. Yeah, really good to be here and uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, speaking to you. Yeah, mate, haven't talked much snooker on the podcast before, so uh, I'm sure you'll be able to teach us a lot today. So I'm looking forward to that and it's probably worth mentioning off the top that as you can probably imagine, my uh, my snooker knowledge is not too great. So I apologise to all you massive snooker fans out there and all the embarrassing things I'll probably say today, mate. But uh, And I apologise to you too. Uh, <laughs> maybe you want to kick things off and, and let people know how you're, yeah, how you get, got started in the betting industry and, and maybe how you chose snooker as your, your main sport to be betting. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I was... I was massively into snooker when I was younger and I got it into got into it with uh, with my dad um, I had a, a small table at home and then it went into being a, a, a big table uh, full size in um, it was in my conservatory and yeah it sort of went from there and um, I started entering sort of junior competitions at the age just before my 12th birthday over in Leicester which is in the East Midlands and yeah, I, I encountered um, loads of players um, who are on tour now. Um, you're looking at probably 30%, maybe 40% of the tour. Uh, I've come across as a, as a junior player. I mean, I came across um, in my early, very early days, in my first sort of year as a, as a junior, I came across Mark Selby, uh, Ricky Walden, Tom Ford. Um, and then I, I played um, Judd Trump um, at um, eight years when he was eight years old, um, and I mean, there's been some absolutely brilliant junior players that I've come across, uh, the likes of Jamie Cope, who's who's a former top sixteen player, Jimmy Robertson, Gary Wilson. Um, I even came across Mark Allen and Ding Jun Wee in some junior events as well. So um, yeah, I, I'd say thoroughly. You know, enjoyed um, you know, playing the game. Um, I don't play much now. I, I, you know, I much prefer watching the game and studying the game. Um, and it's only the last about 2017 I started um, sort of showing my my sort of snooker knowledge, I suppose, on on uh, on Twitter and do and sort of putting out my tips to um, you know to Twitter and. Um, yeah, I've had quite a successful successful time of it, and I say I, I, I did start betting on Twitter. Really, uh, no, I'm sorry, not on Twitter. I started betting uh, myself, obviously, when I was legal to do so, at about um, eighteen. And I've always been, you know, pretty damn um, sort of hot on the snooker, you know, and know, you know, what what you need to do to to uh, succeed in the game. And uh, yeah, I, I say it's it's a it's a very sort of volatile sort of sport to. Um, to, to tip on, but I would say we'll go into more of that uh, later on today. Yeah, so how did you, I guess, get into the betting side? Was it more so that you were, I guess, you know, being growing up with snooker and having a great knowledge around the game? Did you then just, I guess, yeah, I guess, were you just betting on it for fun and then you just noticing that, oh, okay, well, I'm actually doing okay at this, or did you actually like yeah. put lots of time and effort into it and, and actually really try to create an edge there? Yeah, that's probably it. I mean, if I used to work in a, in a bookmaker's um, sort of near to me, and um, I would sort of speak to the punters and I'd speak to my colleagues about snooker, and you know, they'd sort of come to me and say, Oh, who's going to win this? Who's going to win that? And you know, I'd give them an idea of you know, who I fancied. And, a lot of the tips sort of would, would come off, and um, I think, uh, lads, I say in 2017, a, a few a few of my friends sort of said, "Oh, you need to um, you need to go onto Twitter and start putting the tips out uh, you know, on Twitter." And I said, "Oh, I ain't so sure about that." And and they said, "Oh, you know, you need to give it a good push and give it a go anyway." And um, say in my first season, um, I actually started in October in 2017, so it was in 2017-18 season. And um, from the October till the end of the World Championship, which is obviously the start of May, I picked um, six outright winners, which um, was really it's, uh, pretty damn good going. Um, you know, obviously, outrights 
are sort of like a bonus in a way um the tips on you know your sort of bread and butter are your um you know your round by round sort of match betting tipping mm. but yeah the, the outrights are always um a, you know a bonus to to, to net a winner and obviously they're the hardest ones to win because obviously you know you may, most tournaments you've got to win sort of six or seven event uh, you know matches to win the event yeah so what's your what's your process nowadays in terms of finding tips are you do you have you don't have a model or anything like that or are you just analyzing the game and then matching that up and maybe you're just doing your own prices can you kind of yeah share yeah. your way of finding yeah. value on snooker absolutely yeah the you said it uh, just um what i try and do is i price up all the matches um uh, there's a tournament coming up at the end of this week the english open qualifiers so about a week ago before the bookmakers have got in i um i do my own prices um and i get the value from um you know from if the, the bookmakers in my opinion have made a mistake now majority of the time the bookmakers will be um sort, sort of spot on i mean I've looked at some prices today that they've just sort of opened the prices for the English Open today. And there's only really one price um, that, you know, is a little bit um, overpriced, in my opinion, from what my prices are compared to what the bookies have done. So I say, I would say 75% of the time, they're, they're, especially the ones who open up prices, you know, they're the hardest ones to do, you know, to, to be the first one to put the prices out. I would say 75% of the time, or maybe even, even greater than that, that, their prices are very, very similar to mine. So hence not a lot of value, but there is the odd odd ones where they make mistakes in, and um, that's where you just got to jump on the value. And obviously value doesn't always win, of course. Um, and I do, I do a lot of my tipping on sort of value bets where I think the price is wrong. But it, sometimes I'll, I'll I'll back a player or tip a player that I think would just win, but it necessarily um, you know really good price. But um, yeah, a lot of my sort of um, insight is is looking at uh, players who are value with with my sort of knowledge of the game. Yeah, I guess that's a. As sometimes that's a really good way of, of seeing if you have an edge or not, because if you go and price up every game. And you see that you've, you know, your your prices are way off on every single game, then then most of the time you're probably wrong because the bookmaker is not going to make 100. percent You know, it's not going to make mistakes on every single game. Like it's only going to be a couple, or I mean, it's every kind of betting market, isn't it? It's not like, you know, if 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 I'm betting soccer or tennis or any sport like that, it's not like, uh, yeah, every game that I follow, I'm going to be able to find an edge. So it's probably a good way of of showing that that you do have an edge i guess is that you know you're not coming up with prices that are yeah you're not finding value on every single matchup if you get what i mean exactly uh, yeah you're exactly right it's, it's, it's with myself it's it's a case of I, I i just don't bet for the sake of betting i mean if, if i see something i think oh half fancy and oh no the price is not right i probably won't go it uh, you know i'm quite a sort of instinctive better i could easily do my tipping without um you know without doing my own prices because i could just see it i can see prices that are wrong or that are overpriced by just just instinctively just by seeing the price but i i do like to sort of um you know do my do my own prices because i can sort of really make a you know an effort of looking at what they have put what they've put on for a price and what i've done myself yeah nice mate um and how do you are you measuring like the success of your your betting just through wins and losses? I'm obviously not too familiar with the with the snooker betting market. So are you able to? I mean, in a sport like you know football, soccer, you can go and check out what the closing line was and see if you're beating all the closing lines. Uh, you know whether that be an over under or an Asian handicap. Can you do anything like that with snooker to to measure your success? Just like simply outside of just wins and losses. Um, well, I, I do obviously keep a, a log of all the bets I, I, I tip. Um, you know, profit and loss, I think, is really important to keep a log on. And obviously, a um, return investment, I think, you know, gives you a good idea of, um, you know, how, how you're getting on and how you're progressing. Um, I've got 
um, you know, like 55 point uh, profit since I started in 2017. I had a really good start, obviously, you know, like I mentioned, the, the, you know, I was 111 points up for one first season. The next season, I lost like 85 points, which was um, horrendous. But since then, I've been very sort of, I'm quite a careful sort of tips. I don't go sort of over, I don't go over the top of my sort of point stake. Um, my, my tips generally range from sort of 0.5 point to 1 point. And I might sort of go a little bit um, above like 2 point. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't uh, you know, I want to keep, you know, I don't want to go too um, over the top with um, with my selections. I'll, I'll, I always read, them, obviously, all my bets. And you can probably, you know, when you read my stuff, you, you'd... Um, You'd sort of you read between the lines that um, if I fancy something quite strongly, um, but yeah, I think as I say, as you said from the start, I mean, I think um, yeah, keeping a, a, a profit and loss is um, is important. So um, so the you know the people who are, who are in, on your service can um, you know can keep up to date with it throughout the season. Yeah. So there's no there's no like. Uh... I guess closing price at all. Like, I mean, in soccer, you can just follow like Pinnacle's closing prices, like the sharpest bookmaker. Is there anything equivalent to that in in snooker, or are you just simply ROI orientated? Um, no, I don't really. I don't look at Pinnacle to be honest. I have done in the past. Um, there is some sites that you can sort of see what they uh, the price ended at, but um, no, it's not something that I find too important. Um, but certainly not in snooker anyway. And and you mentioned having like a really good first year when you were tracking your bets and then a poor second year. Can you kind of explain what you think uh, went right in the first year and, and what went wrong in the second? I, I do feel in snooker that you do need a little bit of luck, um, especially now I'm betting. Obviously, I did have a, um, you know, I had a, incredible winning streak um say six outright winners and they just went cold in the second season i don't think i'd do anything different um as i say to, to get an outright winner yes you do need you know you need your knowledge you know i, I look at the draws I, I look at to see oh this guy's got a decent path and i you know i'll tip them maybe for the quarter and then tip him for the outright um but yeah, ultimately it is, it is down to a bit of luck. You, 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 you know, players, you know, are, are going to have you know, you know, with that ball frames and maybe just the first season it all went for them. I think in the second year, I remember the top of my head, I think Ronnie O'Sullivan I tipped for the UK, and he was my only outright winner, and he just had it. It's just everything just sort of went to pass, and I was probably a little bit um, over confident with my stake in that season as well after obviously be, having such a massive profit in the first season i probably went a little bit um a little bit over the top perhaps um in the second season and then since then i've sort of steadied the ship and um yeah it, it is difficult it's, it's it's as i said earlier it's, it's a volatile sport to tip to tip on to bet on i'd say probably 90 percent of the players who play on tour um, can sort of beat all beat each other, and um, especially with the short formats now coming in. I mean, this season they've been in best of fives as well, and that makes it even harder for me. Um, you know, in betting wise, and I do like to sort of leave leave off the best of five um, events. Really, I I find them very very difficult and tricky. Um, I much I much prefer the uh, sort of the longer longer matches. Best of seven is probably just about my limit, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, it's really interesting stuff, mate. It's, it's like, I guess it's uh, an interesting process to, to you know, get off to a quick start and then to, you know, be able to keep tracking your bets and, and see it dropping a bit and then have a bit of reflection to see, like, yeah, where you may have gone wrong and, and what you were doing right before and all that kind of stuff. It's it's sometimes quite valuable to just learn from your mistakes. Do, do you just bet? purely pre-match or um, are you betting in play? Maybe you're using the exchanges, kind of explain, yeah, your process of actually placing your bets and what markets you're betting? Yeah, yeah, I do tend to bet uh, just pre-match. I, 
I sometimes will tip one sort of anti-post. I, I, I could tip in play on an outright. I don't tend to do in play during a match. Um, but yeah, betting on betting sites, um, you know, Bet365 are always very good. They, they always open the price, you know, have opening prices and they do a lot of um, sort of other bets apart from just your, you know, your win and your, you know, your win markets. So you like your, your centuries, your, your, you know, your frame handicaps, um, you know, the amount of centuries, et cetera, so, which a lot of the other bookmakers don't do. Um, mm. But yeah, the other the other bookmakers are starting to um, get a few more sort of century breaks and things like that in. Um, you know, I'd love I'd love the bookmakers to um, use the this bet builder, which I think is uh, very very popular with um, a lot of the sites now. So, like football, NFL, um, sports like that, they they all have sort of bet builder, and I'd love them to do that this with snooker, but. Um, I have actually inquired about it um, before, and they, you know, it's a no go at the moment. But it's something I'd, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd certainly be really interested in if, if they did bring it in. But um, yeah, it's um, it, it's it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great sport to bet on. Um, you know, you have your you know your ups and downs. You have you know, you got you got to be sort of in it to. To get these sort of downers, you know, losing in black ball frames, rig spotty blacks, four threes, you know, deciders, whatever the format is. Um, you just got to put it over your head. I mean, I say I'm getting quite experienced now in my tipping, but you know, I, I you know, if, if I lose a, a decider, it used to absolutely bog me down, it really, really sort of hurt me inside. But now I just, I just sort of just brush it away and just move on to the next one. Yeah, nice, mate. Uh, what kind of, I guess, format matches or tournaments are you like? What kind of uh, are you like shorter format matches or tournaments? Best of three to five frames. Like, what are you? What are you? Um, yeah, I guess like, what's your more successful format? Like, format of a match. Yeah, I, I certainly have a, a better record in the world championship. I mean, the last um, two. World Championship, um, obviously the one this year in 2021 and the 2021. Um, I had very very strong um, events in uh, in both the years, and I I feel like I'm I'm much better sort of suited to the longer format, um, like a Mark Selby or a Kevin Wilson sort of like the tips. So, yeah, I just feel that overall it doesn't always work like this, but. The better player tends to win in the longer formats. I say it doesn't happen always. You know, you can have some some um, sort of shot results, of course you can. But yeah, I feel like you know the longer formats sort of suit me better. That you know, you know, if you lose the first frame or the first two frames in best seven, you really are up against it. And um, you know, you go two or three nil down in a best of nineteen say in the world championship. Um, it's not the end of the world, and it's not the end of the world. It's like a best of um, eleven, even a first of six. So yeah, that, I think the world championship is far better, sort of suited to me, sort of tipping wise. Um, but yeah, best of seven, you, you've got to sort of know which players as well um, are more suited to uh, the best of seven sets or, or whatever format it is. You know, I use a site called um, Q Tracker, and uh, you know, it's an invaluable sort of source for me. Um, you know, you can look at matches from years and years and years back. Um, you can check players' records in um, previous best of sevens, previous best of nines, elevens. You know, the world championship, a any tournament going, and I find that's a massive sort of help to me, where I can sort of say, oh, yeah, his value, and or what's his best of seven record? Like, oh, it's not very good. Um, you know, he's lost a lot of games um, the last couple of seasons. I'll avoid him, but then you got some players who, who who are who you know are real good players at short form. You know, likes of you know Judd Trump, um, like a Stuart Bingham. I've always been very strong in the last sort of four years. Um, and then there's players like and you know Mark Selby, 
uh, who's probably more suited to the longer formats, but are you know are still a very adaptive um, in the shorter formats. Yeah, I get. Is there? Would you say maybe you're having more success in the 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 games with longer frames or more frames? Sorry, because I guess there's. I guess it's like anything, like betting. Like the bigger your sample size, the more you can take away from it. So I guess the more matches there are between, a, or more frames there are between two players, the closer you're going to get to the mean, like the actual, you know, person who deserves to win to actually be winning. It's probably like the same in in tennis, like three sets versus five sets. You're more likely to find the the better player will win over five sets rather than if it's three sets. Then you know, better better chance of something random happening and the worst player winning. Yeah, that's it. Um, you know, unfortunately, with with the the schedules in in the snooker now, you're only getting the long format in the World Championship, um, and you know, in the finals, I suppose. Um, you know most finals are sort of at least best of 17 or best of 19. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the rounds before, you're looking at sort of best of, you know, you're looking at best of uh, 11s in, in some of the sort of bigger tournaments like your UKs, your, um, your Masters, the China Open, uh, they always tend to be a little bit longer. But, um, yeah, your home nation event, um, generally best of seven. Um, the tournaments, you know, that have been on already this this, this year, the British Open was um, was best of fives and that's why I sort of avoided it. Um, it's, it's just not for me. It's just, um, it's, I would say, snooker's volatile enough to be tipping on, but having to tip on best of fives is, um, is so difficult. But unbelievably, you know, the, the, the best players sort of do sort of, you rise to the top, you know, Mark Williams, um, he's got a great record um, in the sort of a very, very short format. Um, he won a, a, the Championship League last year. That was in um, mainly sort of best of fives throughout the tournament, um, even best of threes, I think, in the, like, the group stage. And then, and then he won the uh, British Open. Um, and hey, it's, it's, some players are just adaptable and um, some players just enjoy that sort of quick fire games where, as I said, it's, there's other players who say don't like it, but um, are, are better sort of suited to the uh, to the longer format. Yeah, and mate, your process of I guess pricing up players. Are you looking at statistics, or are you just kind of maybe have you got like a spreadsheet or something where you've got kind of you've jotted down notes on every single player, or I guess is is it sometimes just all from your head remembering yeah all the players you watch play snooker over time like what's your actual process in terms of coming up with that price for a certain player yeah it's, it's down to sort of your knowledge of, of the game really it's um you've got to know all the players sort of inside out um yeah it's it, it is helpful to have the uh that website i said um q tracker it's um it is invaluable, but at the same time, you can't keep, you know, you'd be there for hours looking at it, going through, trawling through everything. You've got to sort of, you've got to know, I've got a good memory of, you know, you know this player is good in this format. I'll avoid him for that sort of format. And, um, yeah, you just, you, you have, you, you've got to have sort of like a, a really good memory of, oh yeah, this player, you know, had previous in, you know, in that format. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's yeah. As I say, to, to to be successful in snooker tipping, you have you've got to have the knowledge. You've got to know, you know, what player, you know, the, you know, the temperament of players, and you know, whether they're they're good against you know head to heads are very very important as well. I think in snooker, sort of psychologically, it's such a it's a mental sport. Snooker is, and um, the certain players who um, are good against. Um, Sort of like the higher ranked players, but all struggle against the lower ranked players. And you know, again, that's another thing that I sort of, you know, if someone just brought any name up um, to me, I'd say, yeah, that guy seems to struggle a lot against you know the um, you know the older players or the younger players. Like a Jack Lasowski, he's got sort of like a quite a poor record against sort of like your older sort of players. Sort of forty plus, he he, he seems to struggle a lot against them. Um, so I, I just know it from from sort of experience, and I say it is it's keeping things locked 
stuck in your head for the future. Yeah, okay. Uh, my, my most common mistake that people make when betting snooker? Oh, it's a good question. It's, um, I would just say that people just sort of jump to sort of conclusions and think and, and don't think logically. You just look at a price and think, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that must be a certain thing. They're not knowing what the players are playing is like. Um, I have so many people sort of messaging me on Twitter or just in general and say, oh, this player, he's got to win, to, you know, he's got to beat that guy, he, you know, wherever he's playing, he's a miles better player than he is. But, you know, you, you do forget that, as I said earlier, you know, 90% of the players, maybe even higher than that, none of them are mugs. They can all play the game. They, um, a lot of them, actually, some of them are sort of like, you know, in the twilight of the year, say like a Nigel Bond, but, you know that a lot of the older players are canny players. They, um, you know, they 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 can they can do things that the the younger players you know don't understand, and they, that you know the younger players can be a bit more on ho. Yeah, it, it's um, it is it's 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 knowing um, you know what um, what a player has done previously. You know, the experience is so important. Um, but yeah. It, a lot of uh, people will say to me, you know, oh, this player will definitely win. Well, I'll say, well, yeah, he probably will win, but he's not value. You know, he, you know, he's a one to five shot for a reason and he should be that price. And I made him that price myself. So, yeah, I think that's, that, you know, tipping a one to five, if you find a one to five shot, yeah, <laughs> seven or eight times out of ten, he's going to win. But, um, you know, I like to look at the value and find someone, you know, who, who's playing a one to five shot and think, oh yeah, he's a, he's a good value at uh, 7 to 200 to 30. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm, I guess on that subject, you've got, you got players of such varying ages and I guess it's not like any other sport where the, the athletes are, are playing for a certain amount of time, maybe 10, 15 years. This is a, a, a sport where you can play for a lot longer than that. So what's it like, I guess, watching a, a player's career develop and and change and it, it, i guess there would be times where they're going to come come in and out of form so what's that like i guess judging someone over such a huge you know amount of years times and and your thoughts on i guess these 60 year old players that are getting wild cards into tournaments lately yeah i think you know you look at um players now and people are saying that you know, the older you're getting, the better you're getting. I mean, as I say, I, I, I meant about Mark Williams. I mean, he's 45, I think, now, or 46. And he's still winning, um, you know, world ranking events. Um, you look at, like, the class of 92, Williams, O'Sullivan and Higgins uh, are still around in the top 16. They've been on tour for nearly 30 years now. And I think it sort of explains that there's not too much talent coming through. There's certainly not much talent coming through in England. Um, obviously, China are like a conveyor belt of players just bring them off um, year after year. But um, a lot of players are getting better with age. I mean, you look at someone like Stuart Bean, who's um, you know he's the world amateur champion in I think he's in '97, and he um, you know he was sort of like a I wouldn't say a journeyman, but he was. Um, Sort of always ran the top sort of 32 and obviously 2015 he was the world champion and um you know he's a masters champion a couple of years ago so um a lot of these players are are, are the real special ones are improving as or, or at least keeping to the same sort of level and keeping in the top 16 as, as they get older and uh, as you look at someone like uh, a mark davis um He's um, a guy from um, East Sussex, and you know he's been around since the early nineties. Uh, Anthony Hamilton, I say Nigel Bond, Ken Doherty. Um, yeah, and going back, you know, to these players you said about um, who are getting wild cards. Um, yeah, it's a really, really difficult one because, on one hand, you're saying, oh yeah, that they're legends, but you know they deserve to have, um, you know, a shot and. On the other hand, you can say that they've, they've, they've had their chance and they've, they've been and they've, they've done it and um, 
do they really deserve it? But then at the end of the day, as I said earlier, that there's not too much talent coming through. Um, I mean, obviously this season, World Snooker have given two wild cards to um, the top two women players in the um, on their rankings. Um, on Yi from Hong Kong and Rianne Evans, who, I mean, she's a, I think, 14-time women's world champion. So there's lots of controversies in snooker. Obviously, Barry Hearn just um, sort of handed the helm to um, Steve Dawson. Um, yeah, I mean, Steve Dawson worked under, under Barry for, for years, and um, I think he's going to keep the same sort of principles that, um, you know, until Jimmy White and Stephen Hendry sort of absolutely officially call it a day and, and like a penalty. Um, I think they are just going to give these um, wild cards out. Um, I haven't really got that much opinion on it. I mean, it doesn't really bother me either way. I mean, if they, they, they want to carry on playing, great. If, um, if they don't, then... But as I say, the talent is, is, um, is, is not... Is not there is talent, but the you know the convey about is not like it is like in China. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting, um, mate. What I guess one piece of advice you'd give to to someone who's either starting out snooker betting or maybe they've yeah they've just gotten started and have been betting for a couple of months. Is there like one piece of advice you'd give to to someone that's just starting snooker betting? That's I guess just for that sport in terms of yeah finding an edge. Yeah, I really have got to know your know your uh, you know your sport. It's um, it's a very very dangerous sort of sport. As I said earlier, to to bet, you know your your odds on favourites. You know, you look at you, know, you can just. I mean, I could just look at a tennis match and think, oh, he, he's one to twelve, and oh, he's bound to win. But um, it doesn't doesn't always work like that. And I think it's finding the edge. With with you know using your knowledge you know having a season of just maybe just doing the bets here and there and just finding out you know who's who and what's what and um, not being too rash into, into your decisions on on whether you know if you you know if you really do fancy someone to want at one to five then I'm not saying you know you can't bet on it but it's um, it, as I say snooker is it's a very hard hard sport to bet on because as I say. On the other side, you know, the other player is, is majority of the time can play. And um, I say, especially in these short formats, um, it's again, it's a very, very hard um, to pick winners. You know, and I, and I wouldn't say betting sort of accumulators is, is a good way forward either. Sort of doing three, four, five, six matches are, are certainly not the way forward, even if you are betting on, you know, short price ones. Um, I think, you know, doubles, maybe trebles is absolute maximum i i don't tend to do that a lot i tend to just bet on a single maybe an odd double um but yeah i think um stay clear of the um sort of like your multiple bets singles no knowledge and um, yeah it's um it is a very very it's a, it's a nervy sort of sport to um to watch um a lot of the time, I'm, you know, I don't watch it, and I'll just watch it on live score, which is probably just as bad. But I, I just, um, you know, that's just that's just down to me, really. It's my, it's just my way of doing it. But um, yeah, it's, it's it's a great sport. It's, uh, you know, it's my my favourite sport of, of them all. Yeah, awesome, mate, and great advice. Uh, just to just to finish off, maybe let people know, yeah, where they can find you, maybe where they can follow your tips, and I got got your twiddle hand twitter handle sorry on on screen here too so uh yeah let people know where they can find you yeah it's um at gw snooker tips um on twitter yeah it's um yeah my, my service is um you know if anyone wants wants, wants to come into it i mean i'm, I'm open uh deals are open to um just to, to message me but um yeah g GW Snooker Tips on Twitter and um, hope to hear from you soon. Yeah, awesome, mate. Thanks very much for coming on and, and thanks, everyone, for listening. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, please make sure you do a quick rate and review of the podcast and subscribe to us wherever you listen to our podcasts. 
Um, but yeah, thank you very much for coming on, George. And uh, yeah, catch up soon, Thanks mate.